Hey, welcome to Radiant Midweek. Here we go. A perfect storm of biblical proportions has wrecked havoc all over the earth. World War III has broken out. Both nuclear and bioweapons have been used and they've wiped out millions, if not billions, of people in just a matter of minutes. An electromagnetic pulse has decimated everything that relies on electrical power to operate from the most basic levels to even the most advanced factories and warehouses. There are food and medication shortages worldwide, and out of desperation for survival, people become animalistic, willing to kill anyone for just a morsel of food. And for that reason, martial law is implemented to keep the peace, but they cannot keep up as society falls into anarchy. It's every man for themselves. Meanwhile, the church sits on the edge of its seat. It's eagerly awaiting this thing called the rapture. How long, O Lord, will you keep us here? Because the world is crumbling around us in ways that we never expected to happen. When will you take us to heaven, O Lord, as the great tribulation seems to be at our doorstep? And slowly this news starts trickling out about someone on earth. This person's presenting a message of hope and healing. He's turning rocks into food for people to eat. He's making sick people well again, restoring the power grids. He's negotiating peace between nations that are pitted against each other. Things that seemed hopeless were now, through this Savior, better. People start clamoring towards him in excitement and desperation. And in a short time, he has brought about a worldwide peace treaty and healed the planet. He has fixed economic disparities where everyone has enough to comfortably survive. And he single-handedly brought forth utopia on earth. And the church looks on. It's shocked and confused. What in the world is going on? From everything the Bible says, everything points to this person, this what appears to be a messianic figure, is supposed to be the Antichrist. What seems to be heaven now will turn into a literal hell on earth in just a few years. But why are we still here? Did we miss something in our theology? I read that article just about a week ago, and it really caught my attention. And uh, if you're interested in reading more about it, it was written by the Christian Post. It's called Imagine There's No Rapture. We'll put the link, of course, in the description, uh, written by Adam Hunter on March 28th of 2024. If you're new to the podcast, we're weaving our way currently through Matthew 24, where we're studying the end of times. What did Jesus have to say about these perilous times that are coming? What warnings did he give us and what encouragement, what hope do we stand firm on? But let's dive in today to Matthew 24 on some of the things that we have learned so far. Verse 1, it says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call attention to its buildings. So they're, they're like, isn't this amazing, Jesus? Aren't these really cool buildings? Uh, is, isn't it awesome what we've built? Then Jesus kind of turns that conversation around. He says, do you see these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. They said, tell us, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And to put this in perspective again, remember, Jesus is walking away from the temple. He's been chastising the religious leaders, giving them a series of woes and warnings. And in many ways we talked about, this is a picture of the Spirit leaving the temple. Jesus would not return again. He is walking away. He is done. Jesus then predicts the destruction of the temple. This prompts his disciples to ask three separate questions. 
What were those questions? Well, they said, when will this happen? So when will what happen? That there will be not one stone on top of the other. What would be the sign of your coming? And what is the sign of the end of the age? Now, some say there's just two questions here. It really doesn't matter or change anything. But I think the key thing to understand is when they asked these three questions, they thought they were the same thing. They didn't realize they were asking three separate questions. They believed they were all related to the same event. When will this destruction of the temple happen? What is the sign of your coming? What is the sign of the end of the age? They thought this was all one neat bow on top of a package to conclude this period of time. And unfortunately, though, history has afforded us the realization, because history can be 2020 as we look back, that they were pointing to different things in some ways. And so before answering, Jesus decides to give them some warnings as he begins building his case and answering these questions. We see those warnings starting in verse 4. Jesus answers, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. That's an ominous warning. They will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still not to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And what does he say? All of these are just the beginning of birth pains. Why are these not the actual signs of the end? Why are these not the things that we're supposed to be looking for? These wars, famines, earthquakes. Why? Because they're ongoing. If we look back just at the last 2,000 years, there's been many wars, there's been many famines, lots of earthquakes recorded throughout history, and those had existed long before Jesus came to earth. But yes, like labor pains, there is a hint here that they will grow in intensity until the end. And so you will see more wars, you will see greater famines, the intensity of the earthquakes will increase. However, the warning Jesus is giving us here is this. Be careful about pointing at every new war or another famine, um, earthquakes when they happen, and suddenly declaring, as we often see on other YouTube channels or you'll see them on the internet, hey, it's the end of the world, you know? And, and suddenly there's an earthquake in a part of the world, and people are like, oh, there it is, see? Suddenly we're in Armageddon, or, or they look at a new war, such as like the Gaza conflict, and, and they immediately think, oh, this is a sign of the end, and maybe it is. But maybe it isn't. But Jesus is saying, these are not what you're supposed to be looking for. Yes, these things will increase more and more as we get towards the end. But there are other signs you need to be watchful and looking for out there. And so Jesus also noticed in this was warning us not to be deceived. Why did he do that? And I think the answer is really simple, because people will be deceived. And there's other places in Scripture that seem to indicate that as we move more towards the end times, people's hearts will be hardened, they will grow callous, they will get impatient, and they will be deceived. Especially if the circumstances become such that they are hungry, they are in need of something, their life is on the line, If we don't have a strong foundation rooted in the Word of God, when trials and persecutions and terrors arise, someone whose faith is shallow can choose to go the wrong direction. And so, unfortunately, in the last 2,000 years, we highlighted a podcast, there's a lot of people that have come claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be Jesus, whatever it may be, some version of that. And many people have been deceived in the past 2,000 years by these false teachers. And unfortunately, some of this continues today. And so he warns us of these birth pains, wars, and rumors of wars. And and again, we have to be careful about seeing every conflict out there somehow being the, the end of times. That nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And we discussed that the Greek here is tricky. Um, there's two meanings when he says 
nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It can seem like he's just repeating the wars and rumors of wars here, but he's not. Specifically in the Greek, he's talking about one ethnic group will rise against another ethnic group or one religious group will rise up against another religious group, persecuting them, genocide. That's the picture we are given here. We're given a picture of world war, many nations rising against many nations here. And we've already experienced two very large world wars just in the past hundred plus years and um, still not the end. And so you can only imagine if there's another world war out there that's supposed to be times that are even worse than anything we've seen before. What in the world is that going to look like? Famines will arise, and history has shown our fair share of famines in the past, and then we, in a podcast, highlighted many of the famines that exist throughout the world today, and my heart was just broken to read uh, each of those famines where they're occurring, and, and you just want to help, you want to step in, but you realize, man, this is so big, and, and as churches, we're just called, do your part where you can make a difference where God calls you to, but the burden of seeing so many hungry mountains nourished, thirsty people out there. It, it just burdens my heart, and I hope it burdens your heart as well. He says earthquakes, and you know, it was interesting. At the time of this podcast, we experienced a couple of different earthquakes just in the last couple of weeks. There was one in Taiwan, and then, oddly enough, one in New Jersey in the past week. Uh, we talked about frequency of earthquakes in another podcast. And many people say, oh yes, the frequency and the intensity of earthquakes is on the rise in the past hundred years. But unfortunately, to some extent, we kind of debunked some of that in that podcast saying that it's not so much that we have accurate information that they are more frequent or they're rising in intensity. The truth is we have done a better job in the last hundred years of A, recording them, B, the equipment we use has become more sensitive and better at detecting earthquakes and detecting them even in places that we couldn't detect them before, such as the ocean floor and other areas on earth. And so it's it, it's not necessarily correct to say that there's more earthquakes and they're of greater intensity. The truth is our technology has allowed us more and more to measure each of them, where they happen and, and how often they happen throughout the world. But Jesus is telling his disciples, be careful about looking for signs and these sort of things. They're just the beginning of birth pains from a broken creation. Let's keep going. Verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Don't miss that. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then... And then the end will come. Boy, there's a lot to unpack in just this set of passages. Yes, the disciples most certainly, whom Jesus was talking to here in this conversation, they will definitely be persecuted. And all of them were in one form or fashion. In fact, of the 11 remaining ones after Jesus rose from the grave, remember Judas hung himself, of the 11, 10 of them were martyred for their faith as they spread the gospel, not only throughout the Roman Empire, but beyond. And so he was warning his disciples for sure, you will be hated for this. We see this in the, the book of John as well, where Jesus told his disciples, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. In this world, you will find trouble. When it says at that time, what's it referring to? Well, it's referring to when he says they will be turned over or that many will walk away from the faith. When these times of trouble come, when people are losing their lives, when they have to make a decision whether or not I can feed my family, it can separate who's truly in and who's truly not. Who are the pretenders? Who are the spectators? Who are simply the, the people going through the motions? 
Are you in Christ? Are you a child of God? Are you a citizen and ambassador of the kingdom? When this time of trial comes, will you be ready for it? Or if you're being honest, you're just sort of a casual Christian, not necessarily a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Because what we'll find out in Revelation, for instance, is in the end, there, there will be a mark that people will be required to wear in order to buy and sell. And there's an enormous warning that comes that says that anyone who receives this mark will face the fires of hell. What happens if we're here? What happens if, if what story some cling to, such as the end times, and we read in that article in the rapture, doesn't happen, and suddenly you're faced with a decision that the only way to buy or sell would be to take this mark? Or what if somebody threatens to cut off your head, declaring that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? And so as the verses say here, some will betray each other. This happened in their time. It happened with the Apostle Paul. It has happened for the last 1,900 years as well. It will happen in this end time also. And then a second differentiation here that, again, is often overlooked. And we talked about this in a past podcast, and I want to reiterate that here. All too often when people are talking about the end, the entire focus is on this thing called the Antichrist. But Jesus is clearly distinguishing two different people here, and we need to be really aware of this. Yes, there are false messiahs. Yes, there is a future world leader who will demand the worship of themselves. But constantly we'll see in Matthew 24, Jesus also refers to false prophets, and these are two different groups of people. We will see this in the book of Revelation as well when we dive in. Two very different characters. There is the beast, the antichrist, this world leader, this warrior, and there is this false prophet who points people to worship this beast, who is the head of a religious movement requiring people to get a mark as a sign of their allegiance to this beast. And, and, and the reason I bring this up and kind of hone in on this a little bit is I think we can be so busy looking for the antichrist what happens if we don't have a proper understanding of who this false prophet is and the lies and the false teachings they will be spreading throughout the world? Are we ready for this person also? Be sure to understand two different people. There is a false messiah. There is a false prophet. And it says in these verses that wickedness will increase. And as we look out throughout the world, read the news, I don't know about you, but as I pull up my news apps, it's not good news. And it seems like the intensity of the fighting and the hatred and the evil throughout the world is on the increase. But why is Jesus saying this? Well, he's giving us a caution. Don't go numb. Don't allow your love to grow cold. Don't throw your hands up in the air and don't give up. And he says, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And again, this might test your theological stream from where you come. Because some will say, hey, but wait a minute, once saved, always saved. It certainly challenges the say a prayer, go to heaven formula that we like to have, you know, the easy button in America. And let's say the scenario is true that suddenly there is no pre-tribulation rapture. You find yourself in these terrible in times with a ruler and a false prophet demanding that you take a mark, uh, that you deny your faith or you might lose your head. And, and Jesus did remind us, by the way, you deny me to others, uh, I will deny you to the Father. Be cautious of that. And, and what happens if you take the mark, but Revelation says you do this, man, that is a one-way trip to hell. That theology of, wait a minute, I had this moment where I said a prayer. I had this moment with God, and, and, and I'm saved. I'm good forever. It doesn't really fit in this narrative. And so we have to be careful, and, and we have to really test the Scriptures on this. He tells us here, you need to persevere to the end, and you're going to need to make good choices. Let's keep going. Verse 15, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, this is spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And by the way, 
Jesus didn't actually say, let the reader understand. They believe that the writer of the book put that in, let the reader understand, was pointing towards it. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. And it will never be equaled again. Wow. We can be quick to just read over that and just move on, but will never be equaled again. Here's the big sign. While the others are birth pains and they're leading up to the event and maybe they're increasing in intensity, sure, all those things. Here is the one sure tell sign that you are in the end times. And that is the abomination that causes desolation. Be looking for this. Now, that being said, we talked about in a podcast, uh, for a temple to be desecrated, there needs to be a holy place. You need a temple. Now, the building itself of the temple, uh, we don't have time to go into all of that, and we will in a future podcast uh, talk about the temple because it's important for us to understand all the stations and the layout to fully understand the book of Revelation. But inside the main building itself, there were two places, two rooms. There was a holy place and there was a holy of holies. He's referring to the holy place here, but yes, uh, they often referred to the entire building, both rooms, as the holy place too in other writings. So he could be referring to one, or he could be referring to the room with the holy place, which was where the showbread was, the altar of prayer, and the lights um, that uh, lit up the room were in that section of it. Some kind of statue, according to the book of Revelation, we'll get to this later, is placed inside this building as a mockery and as an abomination. Now, Jesus references Daniel here, and the author makes sure that we know that. What would he be referencing? Well, as we go back to our Daniel study, we, we learned about Antiochus Epiphanes, and we've talked about him. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. He put a statue of Zeus in the temple. He sprinkled pig's blood around the temple mount. He ended the daily sacrifice, made it illegal to get circumcised. He burned holy books and scrolls. He changed what was taught in schools. He demanded people dress and talk a certain way. He attempted to change their calendar and their festivals. Basically, he wanted to make the inhabitants of Judah in that time Greek, a Hellenistic culture. So he's trying to get them to reject their Jewish upbringing and the law, and he was trying to make them Hellenistic. He was trying to make them Greek. And so while the circumstances aren't exactly the same as what Antiochus did, this is meant to give you an idea of what will happen in the future, even the severity of what happens. An empire or a person will end Jewish worship. They will set up an image. They will change customs and calendars. They will defile the temple. They will demand worship. Some kind of image, again, in that main area, uh, whether that's a symbol or whether that's a statue of a person, will exist, and they will demand worship of it. Jesus is saying, when you see this happen, run for your life. Get out of there. Times like we have never seen before are about to happen. And that's what we need to know too. Jesus seems to think this one thing in particular, when you see it, get out of there. He continues on in verse 22. He says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And at that time, anyone who says to you, hey, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And see, I've told you ahead of time. In other words, I've warned you, okay? If you're reading this, you now have a warning. After the abomination, it indicates here we will experience a time like no other. It's the height of human depravity, rebelliousness, violence, and chaos. And if you think about some of the horrible wars that we've seen and just some of the most difficult times in existence, this is worse. What does that mean? It's hard to wrap our minds around this. 
but this is the natural result of humankind living our lives outside the plan of God. We are destructive to the creative order. We we like love and or we like war instead of peace, death instead of life. Sin runs towards ruin rather than rebirth. Satan and his army, when they are allowed without any restraint whatsoever to just spread this evil throughout the world, they want to destroy God's creation and God's people. Satan during this time will have unbridled power to do things as he wishes, but we're reminded out of grace, God will cut those days short. As we are moving closer and closer to destroying ourselves, God will intervene. Why does he intervene at that moment? Because I think constantly he wants to remind us of our depravity and just how far we can go. And it's only you know in your lives at times when you finally say, I give up, I can't fix this, I can't do that. God, you're going to have to. That oftentimes God intervenes. He's waiting for you to just get on your knees, to surrender, stop trying to fix things yourself and say, it is only through my will, my power, my grace, my mercy, and my love that this can be accomplished. Are there areas in your life that you're still trying to fix it yourself and you have to let go and let God and this sort of things? It says here he does it for the sake of the elect. And again, your faith stream might paint a different story here. We don't have time to go in who are the elect here, who is the audience. For the sake of this, I'm just going to say it's the people of God. Okay, so something, again, to notice in this set of verses, Jesus mentions two different groups of people again, or two individuals. There's a false messiah, there's a false prophet. Now, when Jesus repeats something, we should always pay attention, especially when they're in close proximity. He's saying, this is important, really, don't miss this. And then notice that last warning he gave in that set of verses, says, they will perform signs and wonders. Again, before he had warned us, and a strong caution not to be deceived. And what are one of the ways that we could be deceived? Through signs and wonders. We'll see this in the book of Revelation again as we dive in. But he's reminding us again, have a good, strong rooting in what the Bible says and your understanding of what I'd call Christology. Do you truly understand who Jesus Christ is? So that when someone pushes and challenges at that, when they say he's not the Son of God, he didn't really die on a cross, he didn't rise from the grave, he's just a a prophet. Do you have a strong foundation in Scripture to be able to argue that or to not be tricked by it. And Jesus, again, is telling this story about signs and wonders. We'll see it in Revelation so that we could be watchful and looking for that too, so that we are not deceived. There are people coming who will perform signs that will be amazing. It will seem like it's something from God, and it will cause many to have doubts. You have to have a strong footing in scripture and this end time story so that you can protect not only yourself, but your family and those around you. Do, don't be deceived. Let's continue in verse 26. He says, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in an inner room. Don't believe it. And then he tells us something kind of confusing here. So we'll unpack it here in a second. He says, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will it be with the coming of Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, in other words, a dead body, that's where the vultures will gather. There's a lot of argument about these verses. I think we just need to simplify it for a little bit. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to be in the wilderness teaching like John the Baptist did. He's not going to be in the inner rooms like Jesus with his disciples celebrating Passover at the Last Supper. If you see someone tell you uh, to come visit the Messiah or the prophet, don't go. He talks about lightning here, and this is the big debate. Well, what are we saying here? And, and, I, and we just need to take a step back and realize this is an idiom. It's a cultural saying. They would have understood in that time. We have sayings in our own time today as well. But don't overthink it. If you've ever watched a violent storm approaching I grew up in Florida. We used to see them coming in from, from the water 
towards us. You could see it from miles away. That's what Jesus is saying. You see the lightning, you see the clouds, you see the storm coming, and it's going to be the same with Jesus. You will see it from far off, but heed the warning. The Son of Man, a term from Daniel chapter 7, is coming in the sky, not the earth. Look to the sky for Jesus' return. So when they're saying, hey, come to this room, come to the wilderness, come to somewhere here on earth, no, Jesus is saying, look up to the sky. You will see him coming, just like you see lightning far off and that a storm is approaching. That's the coming of Jesus Christ. It will be undeniable. And that's why he ends with where the vultures gather around dead bodies. Why? Because vultures are scavengers. And so where there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. And our first reaction might be, man, that's, that's really kind of dark. It's really kind of sad. But we talked about this in another podcast in describing the day of the Lord. I think people are confused that Jesus suddenly shows and makes everything right. And that is not how the day of the Lord is described throughout the Bible. It is a day of death and destruction. Jesus' robes are dipped in blood. He has fire in his eyes. This is a day of judgment. Verse 29, this is immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Immediately after the distress of what days? Again, we can't add to the Bible here. We have to go back to what we know. And we're getting to that point where Jesus reminds us there will be persecution, there will be turning away, there will be false prophets and messiahs who have signs and wonders, there will be an abomination that causes desolation. It's after those days. Those are the signs to be looking for. But then another big sign he gives us, and this is taken from Isaiah and Joel, the sun is darkened. And this could be a number of things. It says the moon will not give its light. We talked about these in a podcast as you go back. Uh, why could the moon not give us light? Well, we saw in America just here in the last uh, couple of weeks, the total eclipse of the sun in certain parts of America. But this could also be, as we talked about volcanoes, it could be the cause of a nuclear winter. And yes, we, we could just leave it to it's a supernatural event, which is always a possibility as well. It talks about stars will fall. What is that talking about? Is that an asteroid? Is that meteors? Is that a comet shower? Is this satellites falling down out of the sky? We don't know. And again, remember, this is a first century person looking up to the sky and seeing this unfold before them. And he talks about heavenly bodies. And with that first century perspective, what are they seeing? Well, we were reminded in Isaiah 30, for instance, that the earth is reeling like a drunkard. It's swaying. It's tilting. Perhaps maybe the, the orbit or the tilt of the earth is knocked out of place. What if there is a polar shift? Jesus isn't clear here. This could be many different things, and it's just starting to happen at this point. But seeing these sorts of things, especially with a first century mind, and the sky is shaking or it's moving, it would look like that the stars are falling to the earth. We continue in verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels out with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Notice this verse starts with then. It's a transition word, so we pay attention. It literally means at that time. So when you see what he just described before happen at that time, then what will happen? Well, there will be a sign of the Son of Man which is a title, again, Jesus used often to describe himself. Uh, it's taken from Daniel 7, where we see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. There would have been no confusion to the disciples uh, about what he was talking about here. They would have been familiar with Daniel 7. He says he will appear. Now, the English here doesn't give it full credit. Again, a better rendition of the Greek is will shine. And so he will shine. 
It's taken from fino. It's where we get the Latin word fos, which means to give light, like phosphate, to illuminate, to shine, and to appear. It's something shining in a dark place. So as the sun, the moon, everything gets dark, suddenly there will be a light, a sign in heaven. And this is, what is that sign? Boy, there could be all kinds of arguments on this. For some, they say it's obvious. It's, it's the cross, but it does not say that, so we don't add to the Bible, remember. Others say it's Jesus himself, that he is the sign. That could be. The verse here and Daniel, clouds, power, great, and, and great glory, those appear to be the sign. So we'll be looking for clouds, power, light, great glory. And as we always learn, uh, warn, please be careful. Don't add to Scripture. It doesn't say exactly what the sign is here, but you'll know it when you see it because the people of the earth mourn. They know what's happening. It mentions trumpets in here, and trumpets are mentioned in several places. First Thessalonians 4, it says a final trumpet. And the book of Revelation, it talks about seven trumpets. And in the seventh trumpet, there's a story about two harvests. Jesus would talk about two harvests as well. In Matthew chapter 13, we just don't have time to dive into that today, so I encourage you to read it. Um, we will definitely be covering this more as we get to Revelation, particularly in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. But what we learn is that trumpets are a part of the end time story. So we, we're going to need to kind of tear into that and go a little deeper as we go along. He will gather his elect. Again, the debate on who the elect is. But let's be clear, uh, this is the first mention of any gathering in Jesus' story. And it's after, it's when Jesus is returning. Before this, a whole bunch of other stuff has happened, including an abomination and persecution uh, and signs and wonders, false messiahs, false prophets. All of these things are mentioned long before there's a gathering. It doesn't speak to a resurrection here necessarily. The Greek means to bring to a common place. Again, our English doesn't always translate well from the ancient Greek. The picture is the angels finding God's elect and bringing them to a safe place. And so let's try to make some sense. Yes, the scripture speaks of two harvests, whether it's Matthew 13 or Revelation 14. One thing to keep in mind here is Jesus didn't necessarily go in order at this point in Matthew 24. And giving his warning about not following false messiahs and false prophets, as we talked about before, he describes one of the harvests where he says the result of it will be dead bodies and there will be vultures in the sky circling over them, as we often see. He then explains the big sign uh, illuminating in heaven as the Son of Man is on the clouds. And now we're then given the second harvest, which is a gathering of the elect. And so... This is another mention where we said Matthew 13 mentions two harvest. Revelation 14 does. I believe he mentions two here as well. He just It's hard to see because they're not written consecutively there. But there is one where vultures are gathering, and there is another where they are taken to a protected space. Verse 32. Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. And truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And boy, this is another set of verses that gets wildly mistranslated, unfortunately. And people begin looking for mysteries and hidden hints here that just aren't there. Jesus is simply using a farming analogy as he often did in his parables. He would use things they were familiar with that they would understand. But it's interesting what Jesus would say in another story, and I want to check that out real quick. Matthew 16, notice what he says. Jesus replies, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in, in the morning today, it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. Somehow you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. And what's the point Jesus is saying here? He says, just as you know that summer is near by watching a fig tree, you will know my coming is real by being aware of the signs. But all too often we miss it because we're adding things to the story or we're mistranslating it or just the hardness of our hearts. Don't overthink this. The signs will be 
obvious. This generation that sees these signs, the abomination that causes desolation, the antichrist, the false prophet, the signs and wonders they have, the generation that sees these things, they will be alive. They are the generation for when Jesus returns to earth. Verse 36, but about that day or hour, nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, not even Jesus, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, boy, that's going to be key. Clue in on that. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Why? Well, in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, they're marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they still knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and it took them all away. Catch this. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Let's break it down. He says, no one knows. Knows what? No one knows the coming of Jesus, exactly what time it is, the day and the hour. Well, we have a reasonable idea of the season or the general idea of it. We, we should. Uh, Daniel actually gives us some clues and so does the book of Revelation because somewhere around 1260 to 1290 days, that's three and a half years, 42 months, after the abomination that causes desolation, Jesus will return to earth. And we are called to be watchful. We just won't know the exact day and hour, but we should recognize the season. And since most people in the world are not Christians at this time, as we really dive into the story, we find that most of the Christians have been wiped out um, or have chosen not to be Christian at this point. Um, or following another set of beliefs, since most people in the world will not be Christian at this time, they're not watching, they're not waiting. And so most nominal Christians or people who aren't Christians won't recognize the signs. They won't see it. They won't know. But the clue here is Jesus refers to the days of Noah. And so many miss this or they just read past it. But continually, again, as we said throughout the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is cataclysmic. Virtually all life is eradicated. It's an extinction event. Even the earth's topography is changed quite a bit. And so this is that one big last hint he's given us. And why does he mention Noah? He, he's not being cryptic necessarily here, but he is trying to give us a big hint. People ignored Noah's warnings about God's judgment. And I believe many people will be ignoring the warnings that the Son of God is coming back. They went through their life as if there was no tomorrow. They were not watching. They weren't waiting. What happened with the flood is that everyone died. Everyone except Noah and his family who had served God and obeyed him. Those whom God had elected to survive. That's how it will be when Jesus returns. And we've talked about this. It's a cataclysmic event. There will be devastation unlike anything we've seen before. And the Old Testament even says in a couple places that people will be rare. There will be very few survivors of this. So hear what Jesus is saying. When I return, the earth will undergo a cataclysmic event. The elect who remain will be harvested and, and they will survive. They will be taken to a safe place. The rest, unfortunately, will become buzzard food. The sun is going to go dark. The moon will turn to blood. The, the stars are wobbling or they're out of place. Earthquakes like nothing we've ever seen before on earth. And when we get into Revelation, we'll see things like 100 pounds pieces of hail falling down on people. And we might think, well, this is not a very happy story, Pastor Jason. But, and I, and I, again, I think sometimes we have this picture, Jesus comes down and suddenly just makes everything right. And everybody in the world just puts down their weapons and says, hey, we're with you. And magically, suddenly people who were evil or not peaceful suddenly are. And, and that's not at all the story. And he returns, he, he's going to make everything right. Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom a thousand-year rule and reign on earth. But this is preceded 
by earth-changing events, including in Jerusalem, the topography will change dramatically. The earth will be different after this. We are starting over. We keep the story and verse 36 says, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what time a thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. And is Jesus in this story calling himself a thief? No. Again, just using an analogy, just like if you knew that a thief was coming, you would be ready for that person. If you knew when Jesus was coming back, you would be ready for him as well. Be watchful. And so that gets to our second command then. Be ready. And yes, there's some hidden symbolism here to the Passover when he's talking um, that the disciples, being Jewish, would have understood and recognized he was talking about here. On the first Passover, when they were in Egypt, the man of the house was told to be standing and ready for the angel to pass by. The, those who were ready had prepared by putting the lamb's blood on their doorpost, who passed, uh, where the angel of death passed over then that household. And so what Jesus is saying is like that Passover, that first one, are you standing, watching, and prepared? Or like the people in the days of Noah, will you be caught off guard? and you're not ready. Exodus 12, 11 says, this is how you are to eat it. It's talking about Passover. With your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's pa Passover. In other words, eat it with anticipation. Be ready to go when the signs line up. Be ready and watching. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. So are you ready for when Jesus comes back? You may be asking, what does that look like? Well, we're going to cover that more and more in the upcoming podcasts. But he, he told us in Matthew 24 some very clear signs to be looking for. And when we see those, we should be ready for the imminent return of Jesus. But what's clear here in this story as we wrap this up is his call for us to be watching and ready. And I want you to process that. I want you to think through that right now. Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Have you prepared your heart? Have you surrendered your will and your way to him? Have you cried out to God for forgiveness? The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And my invitation today is that you surrender your will and your way and humbly bow down to the king of the universe, declaring, God is God and I am not. Oh Lord, forgive me. Here I am. I want to serve you. That's my prayer. Man, we covered a lot of ground today. Sorry I went a little bit long, but I hope this helped put you put some pieces together. We'll cover some stories from Matthew 24 and 25 next week, and then we are headed into the book of Revelation. And man, I'm excited about that. Again, like and subscribe to the podcast. Some exciting stuff is coming up. You want to be alerted to that. Leave helpful comments if you could. That helps us get the word out to more people out there. And again, May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thanks for tuning in. I love you all. Bye-bye.